Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, tonight uh, for a whole hepatobiliary and pancreas virtual symposium. We have an excellent faculty here to discuss the important topics in pancreas and liver surgery. We have Dr. Tara Siri, Dr. Paul Cork, Dr. Wynn, Dr. Selby, and Dr. Stafford. I myself uh, uh, will be discussing about the pancreatic cancer, and uh, we'll have Q and A session at the end of the presentations. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to put in the chat box uh, and I'll get them answered from the faculty. So first I'll be talking about the pancreatic, pancreatic cancer, surgical management. So this is a disclosure slide. Uh, uh, faculty has uh, have no disclosures except Dr. Tara Sri. She's a speaker and on the board for Beer and Ibsen. I'm going to talk about uh, surgical management of the pancreatic cancer. I'm assistant professor of clinical surgery at uh, Keck School of Medicine of USC. So for the pan my talk about the pancreatic cancer, I'll cover the background of the pancreatic cancer, clinical presentation, role of chemotherapy. I'll talk about that briefly. Dr. Tara Siri will be talking in detail about uh, chemotherapy. And I'll also touch base about surgical management of the pancreatic cancer. As you guys know, at home, we have a lot of uh, pancreatic cancer patients, which we take care of uh, in our hospital. Uh, pancreatic cancer as such is a terrible disease. It has poor survival. 20% uh, patients survive at two years and 5% survival at five years. Surgery is the biggest bang for the buck. So if you can get patient to the operating room, he should go to the operating room. Pancreatic cancer risk factors. Smoking increases the risk twofold. Hereditary pancreatitis risks increases by age 70 is 40%. Chronic pancreatitis is one more risk factor, 4% at 20 years of disease. Family history is a significant risk factor. If you have one family member with pancreatic cancer, the risk is 13 fold. If you have two family members, the risk is 18 fold. If you have three family members, the risk is 57 fold. So how do, how do these patients present? The presentation usually depends on the, where the cancer is located, but most of them will present with unexplained weight loss, wake abdominal pain, back pain, early study, nausea, vomiting, Statoria, jaundice. And when we evaluate these patients, they will have, if the cancer is in the head of the pancreas, they'll have elevated LFTs and present with obstructive jaundice, elevated blood sugar. Sometimes the patients present with unexplained pancreatitis and we cannot find a cause for the pancreatitis or a palpable mass, which is pretty uncommon these days because most of them will be diagnosed with a CT scan or with, the, or with some form of imaging. So diagnostic workup will be consist of a CT scan, uh, pancreatic protocol, we'll get tumor markers like CA99, PRCP, EUS, and biopsy of some sort. Usually these days, it's a biopsy is done by endoscopic ultrasound and surgical consultation. If we look at this diagnostic workup chart from NCC and guidelines, anybody who has a clinical suspicion of pancreatic cancer or evidence of dilated pancreatic and bile duct, which is called double duct sign. They should start off with a pancreatic protocol CT scan. And all of these patients should have multidisciplinary consultation, much like the faculty in this, uh, uh, in this symposium. They should have a surgeon involved, they should have oncologists involved, they should have a gastroenterologist involved. If there is no metastatic disease, patients should get a metastatic workup with a chest and pelvic CT. We should consider endoscopic ultrasound MRI is indicated for indeterminate liver lesions. Sometimes the patient has liver lesions and we cannot differentiate whether the patient is cyst or their metastatic disease. In those cases, MRI is helpful. PET CT is not a routine, but in high risk patients, particularly patients with higher markers, PET CT can be helpful. Endoscopic 
uh, ARCP with uh, stent placement, routinely most of these patients will get a stent placed preoperatively because they'll have obstructive jaundice, more so in the pancreatic head cancers. Liver function test and baseline CA99 after adequate bleed drainage and germline mutation for the biopsies. If they have metastatic disease, then we confirm the, we biopsy the metastatic site and confirm from the cancer. But otherwise, if they have no metastatic disease, then we have to further classify them what type of cancer it is. So when do we do surgery? So we have to, on base the scan, CT scan, MRI, our endoscopic findings, we differentiate these patients into resectable, borderline resectable, locally advanced, and metastatic. All these things depend on the relationship of the tumor with, between, with the sputum mesenterine, portal vein, sputum mesenteric artery, hepatic artery, and celiac artery. The resectable tumor is a tumor which is away from all these vascular structures. So there are clean planes, so we should expect an R0 resection, which means all the tumor, both microscopic and gross, uh, will be taken out from the patient. Borderline resectable is a uh, tumor which is invading partially or uh, circumferentially uh, spiromesentric vein, but partial like 180 degree uh, wrapping of spiromesentric artery or hepatic artery. These uh, tumors uh, usually get chemotherapy first, but you, when we dissect these tumors, R1 margins are usually expected. If we get R0, that's a great result, but a lot of times we'll, there will be some microscopic disease left behind. Locally advanced are tumors which wrap around spirit mesenteric artery completely or celiac artery completely. They cannot be taken out surgically initially. They need some other form of therapy to shrink them so that they can be taken out in the future. Metastatic disease is like when they have this metastatic disease in the peritoneum or in the liver, these patients at this time outside the trial are not the surgical candidates. So for the borderline resectable pancreatic cancer can be category A, B, or C. A is when there is vascular involvement as I discussed. B is when there is a biological involvement. Like the patient is CA99 is very high. And, and C is conditional. Uh, when the patient had, uh, had physiological contraindications for surgery, like somebody had a recent MI, so if we look at the distribution of pancreatic cancer, like in 2021, it's expected about 60,000 patients will be diagnosed with the pancreatic cancer. 50% of those will be metastatic. 15% will be resectable. Locally advanced but borderline resectable will be 20%. And locally advanced and resectable will be 15%. So a very small fraction of these patients will actually be fit for surgery. So what do we do with the resectable lesion in 2021? NCCN guidelines and, and most of the experts will agree that if you can resect, you should resect these resectable tumors. But then there are like recent advances in the chemotherapy. Uh, so some centers will offer everybody new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. An Alliance trial is an example of that. Initial data suggested that there is lower, lower margin positive rate after a new adjuvant chemotherapy and lower lymphadenopathy, and like N1 rate is less. But there is no clear evidence that new adjuvant uh, therapy in these patients will lead in better overall survival. So uh, for me and for my group, if somebody is resectable, we'll resect them initially. So resectable disease as this, uh, NCCN chart shows, proceed to surgery without new adjuvant therapy if possible. Next is borderline resectable. Uh, if somebody is borderline resectable, they all get, if they have a jaundice, they'll get a stent placed and they'll proceed with the new adjuvant therapy and they'll be reassessed for response for the new adjuvant therapy with the repeated CT scans and tumor markers CN99. And if on the reassessment they show progress or the tumor doesn't advance, they can be considered for a surgical resection. So neuroadjuvant therapy is the chemotherapy which is given before the surgery. The advantages for the neuroadjuvant chemotherapy are, it identifies patients with occult metastatic disease, 
this completion of therapy is possible because a lot of patients who get surgery first, they will not be able to get chemotherapy after because of the complications from the surgery. The new adjuvant therapy reduces the incidence of positive margins. It reduces the incidence of pancreatic leak because it is supposed to make the pancreatic gland firmer and so that there are less complication of pancreatic leak after new adjuvant chemotherapy. And also, if we give therapy before the surgery, so we are radiating the specimen, versus if we give afterwards, we are radiating or uh, treating anastomosis. So new adjuvant therapy treatment in, in pancreatic cancer can be chemotherapy, which would be uh, 5-FU, gemcitabine, or forfirinox, or it will be radiation, which is like uh, dealer choice, some centers do six weeks or some and centers do five days and the future immunotherapy and choke point inhibitors. So adjuvant, adjuvant chemotherapy is chemotherapy which we give after surgery. Uh, John Hopkins at Mayo Center, they give chemo radiation, but most of centers will give chemo alone, like gemcitabine 5, FU, Falfirinox, gemcap or gemaprexine. So fall for us, it's well, surgeons really like this uh, uh, regimen of uh, chemotherapeutic agents. It was, there was extensive data about it, that it works in uh, for metastatic cancer, but the question was, would it work adjuvantly after chemotherapy? So protege trial was done, which enrolled 40, 493 pancreatic patients resected uh, and randomized them to 24 weeks of fall for NOx versus uh, GEMX for 24 weeks. Median survival improved from 12.8 months to 21.6 months, and overall survival increased from 35 to 54 months. So this drug, this drug combination definitely works, and, and that's why it got used more and more often in the adjuvant setting after that trial. So now coming back to the surgical resection. Surgical resection uh, of the pancreatic cancer depends on the site of the cancer. If the cancer is in the head of the pancreas, then the procedure is called ripple procedure or pancreatic duodenectomy. And then there are two types of this, standard versus pylorus preserving. Uh, if the tumor is in the neck of the pancreas, then the procedure usually either, either we do central pancreatectomy or we can do extended distal pancreatectomy, which is also called subtotal pancreatectomy. If the lesion is in the tail of the pancreas or distal body, then we do distal pancreatectomy uh, plus minus, we'll take the spleen out. Pancreatic duodenectomy is the holy grail. Then outcomes are so much better than 20, 30 years ago. And now with the uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, pancreatic duodenectomy is done with the robotic and laparoscopic approach. So open uh, Whipple, which is the most common way of doing this procedure. Procedure usually starts with ex exploratory laparotomy to rule out any metastatic disease to liver or peritoneum. If there's a metastatic disease, then, then most of the surgeons will not proceed with the Whipple except in certain circumstances. Then the next step is mobilization of the duodenum, which is called Coker maneuver, then hepatic hyalur dissection, mobilizing the bile that and the blood vessels supplying the pancreas, then we mobilize the duodenum and the jejunum and transect the stomach or duodenum and jejunum. And the final step will be dividing the pancreas and uh, deciding the alcinate process from the retroperitoneum and taking the specimen out. Then the specimen will be examined by the pathologist for frozen section in case uh, any of the margins are positive and we have to re-resect that margin if possible. Final step will be the reconstruction, usually Three, three anastomoses will be done. First will be the pancreatic jejunostomy, which is connecting pancreas to the jejunum. Next will be the hepatic jejunostomy, which is connecting the bile duct with the jejunum. And the third will be connecting stomach or uh, first part of the jejunum with the, with the bowel. So the whole continuity is restored and the uh, patient can eat and bile and pancreatic juice can drain normally. Now with the, with the robot coming into the surgical field, uh, robotic uh, Whipple is getting more and more common and more people are doing it. Uh, essentially the steps are same as the open Whipple, except that we do this, the small holes and uh, uh, criticisms for the robotic Whipple is it's a higher cost, capital cost, because robot is $2 million investment at start. 
and a longer operative time. Usually the operative time, time for most of the surgeries is twice the open surgery time. Non-superior oncological results, the results are same, uh, which is good for robot because that you can prove that the results are equivalent to the open surgery. There's a need for trained assistant who can help you in the OO operating room. And there is no been proven benefit of the laparoscopic surgery. And there is steep learning curve. Uh, you uh, at least need to do about 35 to 50 procedures to get good at doing robotic weapon. I'm going to show you a brief video. This video shows how the pancreas is taken off the portal vein. Uh, and this uh, video is like a four times the normal speed, so I'm not that fast actually. Uh, but uh, you guys can see that the suction, we're suctioning from the portal vein and dividing the pancreas at the same time. At the end of the video, the pancreas will be uh, separated from the portal vein. And here I'm dividing the pancreas with the electric artery and uh, the pancreas is completely divided there except the top part, which uh, we are uh, dividing and, the, and the, that is the portal vein down there and the pancreas is totally free. Next is uh, the reconstruction part. This is a video where I'm showing that uh, we're connecting the bile duct back to the jejunum the one good benefit of the robot is that the, you can do excellent suturing and it's almost as good as, as actually sometimes it's even better than doing open because of the robotic magnification. Uh, the magnification is 10x, which is 10 times the normal magnification. And the next video I show that restoring the uh, gastric continuity. And this is the gastrogenostomy where I'm connecting uh, stomach to the jejunum. So we make openings in the stomach and the jejunum. Then we'll use the robotic stapler right there, uh, which connects the stomach with the jejunum. With the robot, the degrees of freedom are excellent. And so it's easier than the usual laparoscopic surgery. And there's a lot of data from, about the robotic people. This is paper written by us from the USC, uh, which showed that robotic surgery was uh, over the last 10 years experience, that robotic surgery is equivalent to the uh, open surgery, which is that what we, what do you want to prove uh, oncologically and also regard to surgical complications, uh, recovery, readmission rate. Only thing is robotic data is getting better with each passing day because people are getting more and more experience with the robotic technique. And this was a similar similar findings from a different uh, group uh, published in Annals of Surgery. They randomized 982 patients in each group, open and robotic, and similar uh, robotic was compared to open in feasibility and safety, and that resulted in similar oncological and survival outcomes. Uh, then there are two types of Whipple, which a lot of uh, uh, people will be asking us, what is the benefit? Usually at the end, it comes to surgeon choice. There are pros for the pylorus preserving is less ulcerogenic and less dumping syndrome, but cons are the gastric emptying disorders are more with pylorus preserving. So there is no difference in outcome between the two types. So at the end, as I said, it comes back to surgeon's choice, which are very comfortable with. Uh, similarly, as I told you guys, the uh, distal pancreatic meat for the tumors in the, in the tail of the pancreas. Hopefully this video will work. Yes, yeah, so here, here there's a tumor in the, in the distal body of the pancreas, we're making the tunnel under the pancreas, that is the splenic vein. And, uh, and there's the splenic artery and there. This is splenic artery has been tied off. Next we'll divide the splenic artery. Uh, So you guys can see how comfortable uh, the lap uh, robotic uh, suturing and tying is as, is as well as you're doing it open. That is one of the benefits of the robotic surgery. Here, the splenic artery is uh, cut next. Uh, so we're freeing the uh, pancreas from the splenic vein there. 
Next, we bring an intraoperative ultrasound to check the uh, the spink vein is uh, clipped first. And then the ultrasound is being in and we check the, uh, the location of tumor before dividing the pancreas. Uh, with the robotic technique, there's, we can do more splenic preservation. Pros are there a favorite complication. If you preserve the spleen, uh, cons are time consuming, less, on, less of oncological operation if you uh, preserve the spleen, there's no real difference. And it's also is ultimately a surgeon preference whether you, you want to preserve the spleen or not. Total pancreatectomy, there is, uh, this is more for tumors like IPMN when the whole gland of pancreas is involved or sometime uh, when, the, when there are multiple spots of tumor in the pancreas. Pros, there is no pancreatic anastomosis complete, uh, usually is sometimes used in the neck tumors. Cons, there is like patients almost become uh, exocrine insufficiency and they're dependent on the pancreatic enzymes for life. And also they become type three diabetic. They need uh, insulin pump for the rest of their life. Uh, the important thing you, which we'll see a lot about these procedures is surgical complication. Post-operative recovery can be uh, lengthy. Early post-operative complications happen in 30 to 40 percent of people. It's really life-threatening. Mortality is, should be less than 5%. In recent data, it's less than 2%. Then like 40, 50 years ago, when it was all, almost 50%. Delayed gastric emptying is the most common complication. Stomach take, does not empty after the Whipple for some reason. Usually it's believed to be from the uh, neurogenic uh, influences. It happens more in people who are diabetes and or the ner nerve disorders. Pancreatic fistula is the most dangerous and Pancreatic anastomosis is the most common anastomosis, which tends to leak after uh, surgery. Long-term circulate, diabetes is very rare. Pancreatic insufficiency can occur in patients and it's common and it's easily treatable with the pancreatic enzyme replacement. Marginal ulcers happen in people uh, and lifelong acid suppression is used for that. Post-gastrectomy syndromes, dumping, diarrhea, vitamin B12 deficiency, and biliary stenosis is very rare after Whipple. Uh, for people who are metastatic, the palliation takes the form of, for the jaundice, biliary stenting, and uh, as uh, our gastroenterologist will discuss, we always do like uh, uh, endoscopy stent. Biliary bypass is, was done previously in surgical, uh, by surgery, but less commonly used these days. Gastric outer obstruction, you can place a duodenal stent or a duodenal bypass. For pain, celiac plexus blocks because the tumor tends to invade the celiac plexus and cause a lot of pain in the patients. So celiac plexus block is uh, used for pain. So in summary, surgery is still the key. Chemo is important, but we need to do better with chemo. And uh, hopefully Dr. Siri, who's our uh, next pre uh, presenter, will discuss about that. I'll take questions about my part of uh, thing at end of, along with the other uh, sections. And uh, thanks for listening to talk. Now we'll switch gears. Now we'll talk about benign diseases of the pancreas. We have Dr. Cork. He will talk to, uh, talk to us about endoscopic management of pancreatitis. Dr. Cork is a board certified gastroenterologist with fellowship training in advanced endoscopic procedures. After completing his residency and fellowship at USC, he went to spend an extra year at Indiana University. Indiana University is one of the nation's top programs for biliary and pancreatic disorders. Dr. Uh, Cork practiced at Hogue, and uh, he has been, I have been working with him for the last four years. He's an excellent and endo advanced endoscopist. So Dr. Cork will speak about endoscopic management. Dr. Cork. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh, for um, uh, putting this together and for inviting me to speak. Thank you to the audience. Um, uh, like Dr. Sheikh said, we're just really switching gears here. Uh, he only gave me 10 minutes to talk about all of pancreatitis. So uh, he must think I'm a fast talker. Um, so I will be discussing the endoscopic management of pancreatitis. Um, and I just kind of wanted to break this up into acute and chronic and highlight some examples of what we do in this uh, short time that we have. So uh, in acute pancreatitis, uh, endoscopy 
comes down to working up the etiology. That's where we do EUS, and it's a really powerful tool for that, um, treating pancreatic duct leaks and, of course, treating Waldorf uh, pancreatic necrosis. Um, on the other side, in chronic pancreatitis, EUS is uh, very helpful for diagnosing uh, what we call early chronic pancreatitis, patients with abdominal pain who have negative uh, CT, MRI, uh, Imaging uh, EUS is more sensitive for finding the, the early features uh, of chronic pancreatitis. Um, and then we can treat things like pancreatic duct stones, strictures, and um, pseudocysts. So to start off uh, with chronic pancreatitis, uh, uh, like I said, EUS is a mainstay in the diagnosis. Uh, when you read our reports, you'll often see these criteria mentioned um, in that table on the lower left. Uh, this is the uh, Rosemont criteria. We usually use a simplified version of this uh, without the major A, B, and minor. Um, but this gives you an idea of some of the things we are looking for. Uh, a, a very healthy young person will, will have a normal pancreas. Uh, all of us might tend to have a few minor features, um, like some hyperechoic stranding, those are bright little strands in the pancreas that we see on EUS. As someone starts to accumulate uh, three or, or definitely when they hit four or five of these uh, more minor criteria, along with the correct clinical situation, that's uh, often enough to diagnose early chronic pancreatitis. Um, over on the right-hand side, you see ERCP. Uh, it can sometimes still be used for the diagnosis of early chronic pancreatitis. You, we will occasionally see the patient who even on EUS has minimal features. And when you do a pancreatogram, which you see there, um, they have an irregular uh, or ectatic duct. You can see the duct is kind of wavy. Those, uh, those are dilated side branches. This is a patient with divism. If you can recognize the scope position there and the, the angle of the duct, um, but mainly it's these uh, uh, side branches um, that are also irregular and dilated. I put in here also uh, second on that list for historical re reasons. Uh, people used to do uh, give secretin and then aspirate the fluid from the pancreatic duct uh, during the ERCP and check for bicarb levels and but it's really time consuming and cumbersome. So I don't think that's really widely used anymore. So, and then uh, along the lines of chronic pancreatitis, uh, I wanted to jump into a case to, to demonstrate some of the therapeutics we do. Since we'll only do, be doing one case in each category, we'll jump into a really uh, challenging one. So this was an 80 year old woman with recurrent acute pancreatitis and pain from uh, chronic pancreatitis. She had already undergone a cholecystectomy several years prior. Um, so the starting uh, step would be an endoscopic ultrasound after the routine imaging. Uh, it was negative for a mass. That's always important to rule out, especially in an, in an older person. Um, and it did confirm that there was pancreas divism with uh, stones in the pancreatic duct. Uh, the image here is uh, searching for the minor papilla because she's had recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis. So we will uh, recommend a minor papilla sphincterotomy um, at ERCP. But uh, this was attempted at a, at a, um, at a uh, high volume center somewhere in San Diego. They were unable to find the minor papilla. So uh, uh, she was somehow sent over to Hogue. Um, I couldn't find it either. So that's where we have to get into some of our combined uh, therapeutic options. So here you can see on the left-hand side, that's the pancreatic duct in the body of the pancreas. You can see some features of uh, chronic pancreatitis uh, there with um, some of this stranding. Um, the duct is a little bit dilated. Uh, so it, it's uh, three and a half millimeters. But that's still a really small size, but that, that demonstrates the, the technical capability of EUS because here you see the EUS scope on fluoroscopy. This is not an ERCP scope. We're able to actually stick that duct even at only three and a half millimeters with a, an FNA needle, um, which you're going to see next. Uh, so, 
FNA needle goes into the duct, contrast is injected. So now you've got a pancreatogram um, through a needle going through the stomach into the pancreatic duct. You can see the stone, that lucency uh, right here. Um, and our goal is to accomplish an ERCP. So this is called an EUS rendezvous ERCP. In, in the middle image, you can see a wire being advanced uh, down the pancreatic duct anterograde to the duodenum, and then we'll go and find that wire. Now, uh, there's that um, minor papilla we were looking for, but couldn't really find and couldn't cannulate with the standard approach. So now we can grasp the wire, get our standard ERCP scope into the patient, um, and now have access to the pancreatic duct. We can use this in uh, bile duct cases, of course, too, but it's more technically challenging in the pancreas. Uh, and then we can proceed the rest of the way with a standard ERCP with a minor papilla sphincterotomy um, and then stone removal of this uh, white uh, debris you see here is calcified pancreatic duct stone. Uh, you ask, what if the stones are too big or the duct is narrow? This is a different case, but we can actually um, put what's called a spyglass uh, scope directly into the pancreatic duct and blast the stone. That's with uh, electrohydrolithotripsy or EHL. So we have a lot of options in, in terms of treating these patients with chronic pain or recurrent acute pancreatitis, getting their ducts open, their stones removed, strictures, strictures treated. Uh, we'll shift and now talk about um, acute pancreatitis. So again, as I mentioned, uh, start with the diagnostic component. Um, this is, uh, again, the mainstay of, of uh, EUS in working up um, pancreatitis. It's one of the things we most commonly uh, do EUS for. Um, uh, we are looking for things on the left-hand side like gallstones, uh, sludge in the gallbladder, or what we call microlithiasis, very uh, tiny stones. Um, these can be missed on your standard imaging, um, such as MRI or transabdominal ultrasound. As the case I just showed a minute ago, we're looking for anatomical abnormalities like pancreas divism. Uh, we are looking for cysts uh, that can sometimes, it's rare, but sometimes be the cause of pancreatitis and IPMN uh, that causes a ductal obstruction or a main duct IPMN. Uh, we're looking for neoplasm, small tumors that are missed on CT or MRI. Um, uh, and uh, it's not infrequent that, that we'll find that. And uh, we can also look for features of autoimmune pancreatitis. Over on the right-hand side, I mentioned um, ERCP, but these are again, historical uh, points. For those of you who remember sphincter of OD manometry, we really don't do that, um, but, but it was used, especially in uh, what would be called type two pancre pancreas uh, sphincter dysfunction. And way back in the day, they used to even aspirate bile from the bile duct or gallbladder and try to test for microlithiasis to look for crystals. Um, but now we rely on EUS. So I'm going to jump into a therapeutic case. Um, this is a 22-year-old man who had severe acute pancreatitis uh, due to alcohol, uh, uh, initially at an, out an outside hospital. He had a respiratory failure in the ICU. He recovered, but he was limping along somehow as an outpatient and then showed up at Hope about three or four weeks after um, his initial presentation. Um, so if anyone's uh, familiar with this kind of image, this is walled off pancreatic necrosis. It's about as extensive as you'll see it. It's extending all the way down um, both the right and the left paracolic gutters down into the pelvis. This is all necrosis from his um, pancreatitis. Uh, so just a few years ago when I was in training, um, my uh, mentors who were you know, pretty aggressive endoscopists would look at this. And I remember a couple of cases similar and they said, call the surgeon, this is too extensive. But um, uh, we're, we're constantly pushing the envelope. So this is something we can now tackle endoscopically. How we get access to the, the, the necrosis is um, 
Most often nowadays with what we call our Axios lumen opposing stent, you see it being deployed into the cavity, um, pulling back. And then this is what we see on the stomach side after you deploy the stent, immediate gush of fluid. But what won't come through the stent is the um, solid necrosis that's in these uh, cavities. So in the left-hand image, you see this, the, a CT scan for follow-up. That's that axio stent that gives us scope access to the uh, cavity. But because he had such extensive necrosis, I, I also get asked for the assistance from radiology and they place bilateral percutaneous strains to irrigate um, these cavities and uh, facilitate with the debridement. And then I went in and performed uh, endoscopic necrosectomy. We can pass our scope directly through that um, axio stent. You can see in here initially on some of the earlier procedures, this, this can usually take a few procedures, but you can see some pus inside the cavity that's removing the dead necrosis, uh, usually with a snare to pull it out of there. And now on um, subsequent procedures, it's clean. So what's really fascinating about this particular case, I have the scope going through the, the, the hole in the stomach into the cavity, and I can actually uh, visualize the percutaneous drains. And on the far right, you're looking at the a clean cavity, um, free of necrosis. That's, that's again, the percutaneous drain sticking into the cavity from the outside. And that patient did really well, um, took a few procedures, but he recovered completely. So in conclusion, um, endoscopic minimally invasive techniques have changed the management of acute and chronic pancreatitis and continue to evolve but these cases are varied and can be quite challenging. Um, so it really takes a team effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kork, for an excellent talk on endoscopic approach for management of pancreatitis. And we'll be taking any questions at the end. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, radio frequency ablation and uh, EUS guided, which is a pretty innovative procedure. And we have Dr. Wynn here. She's going to talk about that. As you guys all know, Dr. Wynn is a medical director of Hogue Advanced Endoscopy Center, and she's an endoscopic, uh, advanced endoscopist in Newport Beach. She's a nationally recognized expert in the field of gastroenterology and is one of the Orange County's most experienced physicians in the use of invasive GI procedures, including her exp expertise in outpatient EUS. Dr. Nguyen also... Uh, specialized in pelvic floor dysfunction and uh, fecal incontinence. Today, she will talk to us about uh, radio frequency ablation, EUS guided. Dr. Wynn. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, if you can bring up my slides. Perfect. Thank you. Um, as uh, I think we're switching back a little bit to two more topics and um, uh, thank you, Dr. Kort, for talking about the pancreatic benign disease, and that was exciting. And to see how much we can do endoscopically, um, I think uh, the history goes back to 20 or 30 years when the endoscopic ultrasound equipment was developed, and we've gone from diagnostics to therapeutics um, over the years. Um, so endoscopic ultrasound um, is endoscopy with ultrasound imaging, and uh, the role has been uh, really very important in the diagnosis and, of course, staging of pancreatic tumors. Um, the, the diagnostic imaging with EUS or endoscopic ultrasound takes you beyond what is available with non-invasive imaging. Um, so years ago, oftentimes you have a negative CT, the patient comes in with obstructive jaundice and without the utility or the use of EUS, these tumors can often uh, progress and uh, are often not diagnosed. So with endoscopic ultrasound, uh, you can find small tumors, uh, we can biopsy the tumors, we can stage the tumors. So now the next obvious uh, uh, step would be, what can we do therapeutically? Um, so uh, I, have, I was given 10 minutes to cover, and so I thought uh, this may be a good topic. It's very new, it's kind of the latest thing um, for therapeutic endoscopy using EUS. So it's EUS guided RFA. 
Uh, next slide. So what is uh, EWES guided RFA? Um, of course, we all know radio frequency is a, um, it's a minimally invasive, it's a procedure that uses heat to necrotize soft tissue at the target lesion and hopefully inactivate the, the lesion and the tumor. The RFA probe um, is inserted, um, as you can see here, through the endoscope. Uh, channel of the echo endoscope, and it's placed into the desired area within the GI tract. Uh, so this is the tip of the um, needle. So this similar device uh, we can use for biopsy, uh, fine needle aspiration, or FNA, or FNB, which is fine needle, uh, fine needle aspiration, fine needle biopsy. Next slide. Um, so EOS got it uh, radio frequency ablation. The tip of the needle, the active part is uh, at the tip and then you have an insulator and then a sheath. Um, looking at um, bovine uh, testing uh, using different needle tip length, uh, you can achieve uh, ablation zones that are different depending on the size of the uh, probe or electrode. Next slide. So RFA uh, delivers high frequency uh, alternating current. Um, the RF ablation induces coagulative necrosis at the targeted tissue and causes cell apoptosis. Um, next slide. Next, next, next. So after ablation, you'll see uh, tumor necrosis and um, that image was taken away. Um, so possible applications for EUS guided RFA include uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or small uh, IPMN or intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, cystic tumors, carcinoma, um, pancreatic cancer that's locally advanced uh, or unresectable. Uh, pain management, uh, ablation of uh, the celiac ganglion in uh, controlling pain with patients with pancreatic cancer, um, HCC perhaps, liver metastases, metastatic lymph nodes, and GIST tumors. Next slide. Potential complications for EUS uh, RFA include delayed bleeding, perforation, acute or delayed, uh, abdominal and chest pain, fever, right shoulder pain, of course, pancreatitis, pancreatic duct uh, stricture. Next slide. Um, initial series looking at EOS guided RFA uh, was done in the porcine pancreas. And we looked at uh, 10 adult pigs. Uh, we looked at feasibility, safety, e efficacy um, in the normal um, porcine pancreas. Next slide or pig pancreas. Uh, the next uh, series came from Korea, and this is an initial experience in using EOS guided RFA ablation of unresectable pancreatic cancer. They had a series of uh, six patients, tumor size uh, ranging from uh, smaller tumors to larger tumors in different locations of the pancreas um, with uh, one to two sessions of RFA, uh, duration of follow-up up to six months uh, in conjunction with adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, very few procedure-related adverse events were noted. Next slide. Um, then uh, initial series we're looking at, in addition to pancreatic uh, adenocarcinoma, they looked at um, the use of EUS RFA in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or specifically insulinomas. Um, and so in this series, again, small series came out from um, New York, uh, looking at younger patients who uh, either were high risk because of cardiomyopathy, obesity, um, concerns over major surgery. Next slide. Um, here is an image looking at a CT of the tumor on endoscopic ultrasound. The tumor here is about a centimeter and a half, very distinct. Um, EUS shown to be uh, a neuroendocrine tumor or insulinoma. Uh, after EUS guided RFA, uh, the tumor six weeks later, 
uh, 12 weeks later um, has shrunken and almost uh, barely noticeable uh, with some cystic portions. Next slide. Um, immediate uh, procedure complications, we didn't see any. Um, no pancreatitis shown by uh, normal amylase, patient was symptomatic. Looking at blood sugar immediately post um, uh, insulin level C peptide. Next slide. Um, looking at three months post, six months, and then one year, uh, normal blood sugar levels, uh, patient were asymptomatic. Next slide. Um, a slightly larger series looking at EUS guided RFA and unresectable pancreatic cancer. Uh, before RFA on CT, uh, EUS guided RFA, uh, this is an ultrasound image of the pancreas with the uh, RFA needle within the tumor, uh, seen at one month, seen at two months. Next slide. Um, the series looked at 10 consecutive patients with unresectable non-metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma, showed um, stable uh, and partial response uh, to uh, the tumor, and it was seen post-systemic uh, chemotherapy. Uh, in the series, they excluded chemo-naive patients and patients with um, disease progression. Next slide. Um, this is a summary slide of the series of patients treated with EUS RFA, uh, initial tumor size, um, size, uh, the pancreatic tumors in different locations of the pancreas, uh, number of treatment uh, with RFA, um, looking at seven days on CT, looking at 30 days on CT, seeing a uh, smaller tumor with necrosis. Next slide. Um, here we're looking at um, post uh, RFA without any significant complications, um, no pancreatitis post, um, CRP was really no um, significant elevation, C199 either decreased or remained stable in that series. Next slide. So a uh, brief uh, summary of the data that is small, but I think has potential applications for patients who have unresectable disease and uh, no other options for therapy. Uh, EUS RFA has no readmission or complications seen post-procedure, and the patient can rapidly resume their chemotherapy regimens. Uh, EUS RFA can be indicated in patients with major comorbidities, otherwise not eligible for surgery. And we can do multiple sessions without major clinical events or complications. Uh, the role and timing of RFA, EUS guided, is being uh, studied in um, trials, uh, looking at multi-modal uh, um, therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. Excellent, Dr. Dr. Wen. Uh, now we know we have an option for patients who cannot be resected and also are have uh, physiological comorbidities uh, like EUS RFA. Now we'll switch gears back to the pancreas and we'll talk about pancreatic cysts. Uh, as we all know, pancreatic cysts can be precursors of pancreatic cancer, and this is one place when we can have impact and protect patients from developing pancreatic cancers. Uh, Dr. Selby uh, will be talking to us about the pancreatic cyst. Dr. Selby is the program director of pancreas and hepatobiliary cancer program at Hoke. He's a professor of surgery at the University of Southern California. He has, as we all know, he has extensive experience in hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery. He's double boarded. He's boarded in general surgery and also in surgical critical care. And uh, I present to you guys, Dr. Selby. Thank you, Rashid. Um, it's nice to be here. It's a good opportunity for all of us to sort of uh, give an exhibition on what we're working on at a, at a more advanced level. Can I have the first slide, please? My talk is about IPMN cysts or pancreatic cysts and not just surgery, but management really. And I would say at the outset that this is a, a, a sort of a population health problem. And I define that as 
something like AIDS or hepatitis C or fatty liver uh, or COVID-19, where there's a rapid recognition of a budding problem and then a then a almost like a wildfire extinguishment effort to try and contain it and put it out. So I think for all of us that are likely to be in this audience, it's a very germane topic because the algorithms for management aren't clearly defined yet and concentrated populations in um, larger institutions are going to be required to really define the nature of the problem and the uh, probable solutions. So I'd like to give you the, Ho the unique Hogue experience that we have on this management. Next slide, please. So just as a, as a bit of background, a pancreatic cyst doesn't really have a definition, but it has multiple definitions. So in, when, when I say that we do surveillance on X number of cysts, you know, the, I would include in that the, the list there that you see listed, IPMM, MCN, serocyst adenoma pseudocyst, cystic neuroendocrine tumors, which are only about 5% of all neuroendocrine tumors, and then solid and cystic pseudopapillary tumors. Some of these are easy to define histologically uh, and, and occasionally even on x-ray, but the two at the top are the, are the ones that really we're most concerned about, and they represent the ones with serious malignant potential. The solid and cystic pseudopapillary are easy to define surgically and, and, um, and easy to contain as well. So it's really these two that are oftentimes difficult for us to distinguish from each other that occupy the main bulk. When I say the main bulk, I'm talking probably 90 or even 94, 5% of the pancreatic cysts in the population that we see. However, it's difficult to distinguish between the two of them quite often. Next slide. So this is the actual real and projected volume of patients that we have in our current, I call it IPMN cyst, but pancreatic cyst program. So you can see that we started, uh, we meaning Phoenix Nguyen started looking with EUS at the pancreas back in 2007. And then the rapid incline in patients is a sort of a map for what's happened. And we can see that right now at the end of 20,000 or 2020, we were almost 2,600 patients. And if you extend this curvilinear line out to 2025, we'll be looking at 5,600 patients that will be in, in surveillance, however loosely or tightly, but included in our data set. And um, so this is, this is a real opportunity to learn. And it's also an opportunity to, to, to customize an approach that is effective and economical and uh, track the data that goes with it in order to keep up with the total population. Next slide. Next slide. So as, as we looked at our surveillance cohort, we thought, what we'd really like to be able to do is elaborate an effective surveillance system for IPMN. And the strategy would be that we would look at the likelihood of malignant progression and the presence or absence of clinical disability to triage patients into either surgical cohorts or continued surveillance cohorts. And then and then look at how we came to those conclusions of, of malignant progression uh, as we tried to prioritize the patients. Next slide. So what we wanted to do is establish variables and then compare the accuracy of variables that might predict severe dysplasia or incipient tumor formation within the cysts. We also wanted to quantify, and this is a little bit of a different a sidebar to this, we wanted to look at all of our pancreatic cancers that came in who were not in surveillance and quantify the frequency with which IPMN was the initial pathology of origin that then, then gave root to the pancreatic cancer. Next. Next. So we have three cohorts here. I'll tell you the third one first. This is the patients who have an established clinical cancer. They were not in a surveillance program, but when we looked at their pathology, 
they actually had an IPMN that yielded the clinical pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So that's one group, and I'm going to set them aside for a minute because I'm, most of the talk is about the surveillance and the uh, surveillance cohort and the surveillance operative cohort. So the first cohort is the surveillance cohort. And as everybody probably knows in the audience, most people who have a pancreatic cyst do not have any symptoms. And a lot of people get the information that they've had a pancreatic cyst for several years, and then someone tips them off to the fact that, well, geez, this has malignant progression possibilities, and then they're upset because they weren't informed earlier. So in this cohort, we call them, we say that they're confirmed IPMN drive cysts. That's not always true, but to the best of our ability to judge, we think that it is. So we're, we're trying to look at this surveillance group and see if we can find features that suggest progression. If we don't, then they just stay in surveillance. And then in the number two group, a very small percent of the patients fall out into a and operative cohorts. Either of these patients are characterized by debilitating symptoms, which is a, a pretty small percentage of the overall patients, but I'll show you what the percentage is in those whom we operate on. Or they have ominous anatomic signs that are visible on EUS or body imaging. Or lastly, the molecular diagnostics, which are, are making a run at being relevant here, give us information that we think there's been at least molecular progression towards cancer. And we wanna see how well those relate to the histology we find at, at the time of uh, surgical removal. Next slide. So if you look at the two columns here, you can see that the numbers, the dates are the same. The, the column on your left is the number of new patients and the grand total at the bottom. And the column on the right is the number of total number of endoscopic ultrasound patients. So you can see it's about at this particular time when we put this together, it was about one and a half uh, endoscopic ultrasounds per patient. You know, many didn't get any, and some got only one. Next slide. Um, next slide. I think we've already seen that. So in in order to put this group together, that's actually studying the problem, it's important that the, the institution recognizes both the utility and the feasibility of it, and then tries to make it cost effective. So we have to give a nod to administration because they sort of debt fund the program while it gets going, but we need advanced endoscopists, hepatobiliary surgeons, definitely specialist pathology, radiologists, and fortunately we were able to hire some data analytics people and we employ students as well. It's a great opportunity for physician extenders as nurse practitioners. And ultimately we, we built our own specialty conference around this and hopefully at some point we'll be funded as a multi-institutional project. Next. So the surveillance cohort patients, all of them had some form of imaging and they all had endoscopic ultrasound. And the whole idea here was to look at CT or MR progression. We looked at EUS with, uh, with anatomic descriptions and then the cyst fluid analysis. And we're trying to customize a critical pathway for these patients. And are we gonna see them once or twice yearly and how are we gonna define that? We also wanted to call out the patients with symptoms and important anatomic features. And like we said earlier, genetic markers. And the whole idea is to assign patients to a binary risk system. You can't have four or five different stratifications. They're either low risk or they're high risk. And so we wanted to try and do that with these patients, low risk or high risk for progression. The symptomatology is a different animal because it's really based on the severity of symptoms. Next slide. So in this, in the surveillance patients that went to operation who had symptomatology, these are the features that brought them to operation. And this is independent of a diagnosis of, of early malignancy or high-grade dysplasia. This is just on the strength of the merit of the particular symptoms and how severe it was for those patients. Next slide. As far as uh, the other features that we looked at to try and assign that as variables would have included the cyst size. So we, we selected a cyst size of greater than three, three centimeters. Some 
papers have cited three and a half and some have cited four. Most don't go much beyond four when, dis, when earmarking that as a high risk variable. We looked at pancreatic dust, duct size from zero to five, five to 10 and above 10, and presence or absence of solid nodules and main duct IPM in, yes or no. Next. And then as everybody probably knows, it, there is a commercial risk profile ranking that blends a composite of molecular and genetic features with anatomic features. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to call that a pure study because it, it is a little bit subjective as to how they blend in the anatomic features with the genetic and molecular features in order to get a risk stratification. Next. So when we looked at our own at our own set of patients that we operated on, what we were looking to see is how many of the patients that we actually had a surgical specimen in which the histology showed low or medium grade his, uh, dysplasia. And if we had known that, we might not have operated on them. And how many of them actually had unfavorable, which is high grade dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, microinvasive cancers, or even frank cancer histology. So this is, this is where the rubber really meets the road in terms of, of assigning a histologic predictive accuracy to the variables that we're interested in looking at in the surveillance cohort patients. Next. So, so we took our surgical patients and then, then we looked at, at their histologies and saw how the metrics that we used compared to the final histology. Next. So now we start to get into the meat of it. If once patients went to the operating room um, and they were their resection included the specimen and they were still kicked back into the surveillance cohort as either completely free from IPMN cyst but still needed surveillance because they had a remnant pancreas as residual disease in the gland remnant as, and we followed them up to see if any had died, how many were reoperated and how many developed malignant recurrence. Next, next. So in our, in our analysis of this data, it's, again, it's single center, you can see the dates, uh, 3622 encounters, 2363 patients, women scored better than men, median age is almost 70, when you talk about a range of from 21 to 94, you know these probably aren't going to be IPMN. So these may be MCNs or they may be serous cyst adenomas. So it's a, there aren't many on this end of the spectrum, but there's a lot in the middle. 724 of these patients had, had a molecular analysis with one of the commercially available products. Most patients had a body imaging study yearly and most had one, maybe two yearly clinic visits. And I don't know if you can see this well, but the median time in surveillance for the SRV cohort was 782 days. So a couple of years, range of two to 5,000 days. Next. So I don't know if you can see the bottom line here, but the, but the X axis gives us the age at which the first endoscopic ultrasound was done. So you can see in this bar graph that that the first one was done in more patients between 55 and 80, and it staggers off fairly quickly on both ends. And then if we look at the cyst size at the time of the endoscopic ultrasound as well. So zero to five, five to one, one to one and a half to two, two to two and a half and so forth. So way out here on this end, we see seven centimeters, six and a half, seven, six, six, five, five, four, five, so you can see obviously that the majority of patients had cysts between zero and three centimeters, maybe three and a half, and everybody else is a, a, a way outlier. Next. And if we look at a scattergram of these cysts, pancreatic cyst size as a function of age at entry into care, you can see that there aren't many on this end and these are probably very unique pathology but there's a whole bundle here in the middle 55 to 75. And surprisingly, there's a lot of big cysts 
up here, you know, as an overall percent of the population of patients, it's not high, but it's it may be something to be reckoned with if, if a four centimeter cyst has a high predictive accuracy for bad histology. Next slide. So interestingly, in the SRV cohort, we looked at some anatomic features as well. We looked at pancreatic duct obstruction, and we found that about close to 2% of the patients had pancreatic duct obstruction, but not a high number, obviously. And when we looked at main duct IPM in, it was 1.3. So 1.3, you could say that probably most of these patients with main duct IPM in also had pancreatic ductal obstructions. Next. If we look at solid nodules in that, in that whole count of 3,453 patients who had EUSs, it was 8.9% that had a solid nodule. And interestingly, over time, if the patients had more than one EUS, then they might have, a, they might have disappeared or they might have first appeared during the time they were in surveillance. Next. I'm going to skip that one. So the, one, of the, one of the tracking mechanisms that we use for patients to try and analyze their overall risk is, is um, a risk profile that includes not just molecular and genetic analysis, but it adds in cyst size, main duct IPMN, and so forth. And so that risk profile as a composite gives you a reading of either benign, statistically indolent, statistically higher risk or aggressive, and you can see the breakdown on the numbers. So 65% of the patients are benign, 28% are indolent. And I consider this group the low risk histology. And I consider this group the high risk histology. Next. Oh, I'm sorry, back up that one slide, please. And I, I did want to say that we did have some incidences where patients downstaged their molecular analysis and some who upstaged it. So it is it is possible to shift from one category to another. And we've seen that with the solid nodules and we've seen it with the molecular analyses as well. Next. So this is the SRV that went to operation cohort. So in these patients, they demonstrated some feature that we didn't like, either an indication of disease progression from the standpoint of molecular or genetic risk, ominous signs that we didn't like on the imaging studies or clinical symptoms. In this group, the medium time from when they entered into surveillance and when they were operated on was only six months with a range of one to 108. Yet the total time of patients on average that, that spent in uh, the surveillance was 2353. So that was 45 patients out of 2353. So 1.9% of the surveillance population actually went to the operating room. Next. So if we look at the patients that we operate on, interestingly, more than half of them had symptoms that were, were debilitating for the patients. And so they were operated on not for, for signs of progression, either progression in size or duct obstruction or, mole or molecular changes, but they were operated on for one of these symptoms. The most common being some form of dyspepsia with pancreatic colic, pancreatitis, new steatorrhea, new onset diabetes, and jaundice. So that's almost 60% of the patients. Next. Now, here are the patients um, that make up the, the total of of operative procedures on IPMN patients. And this is a little bit of a twist because the N is 66, it's not 45. These are those established cancer patients that were not in surveillance already. So these came in, they had clinical cancers, we operated on them and surprise the pathology showed that there was an IPMN derived cancer. So we put these two together and threw those together and showed you that the types of operations that were done. Whipple, distal, central, enucleations, total, subtotal, open, close. And we had three of these that were re-ops. Next. So here's our, the operative survival was 100%. The long-term, I don't know how we define long-term, but I, you know, six months maybe was 97%. And the re-op for a second IPMN 
was 7%. So that's an important statistic right there because once they've been operated on, that doesn't declare them free from risk because most of them have multiple cysts that are identifiable if you use something with a high likelihood of, of detecting them, such as endoscopic ultrasound. So I'm going to I'm going to skip these three patients that were reops next. So here's I think this is probably one of the most important slides. So the histology of the cyst that we found. So we we selected patients for operation, and now we're going to we're going to test the effectiveness of the mechanism that we used to select them. So low grade dysplasia, there were eight, eight out of forty out of, out of forty five total. Moderate dysplasia, 16, but, but if you look at this, a fourth of these were symptomatic and almost half of these were symptomatic patients. So that kind of, that sort of erases part of that deficiency and not recognize the, recognizing the de degree of dysplasia. And if you look at the other patients, and again, this doesn't include the established cancer patients. These are the patients that we pulled out of this group of 45 and that was 47% of the 45 that had cancers. And what did they have? They had high grade dysplasia, 13, 69% of them were symptomatic. Carcinoma in situ, four, 100% were symptomatic. Microinvasive cancers, two, 100% symptomatic. And there was one probable fallout, and that may have been partly uh, the failure of the patient to be compliant, but this was a T1N0 that was in surveillance and she fell out in the S SRV cohort. This patient was someone that was a reoperation. She had had a moderate grade dysplasia and then developed a, a um, pseudomyxoma peritonei and she was operated in open close. But the message here is that the overall ability of detecting based on our system of defining the patient's risk profile is pretty good. And these, you could discount some of them because we were dealing with symptomatic patients. It's also important that most of the patients here who had even microscopic cancers or high grade, high grade dysplasia were symptomatic at the time of surgery. Next. So this, in our established cohort of cancer patients, that's 18 patients. These were the stages of the tumors. Again, these patients were not in surveillance. They came in with cancer. We had two T1s, two, uh, five T2s, six T3s, and then these three were node positive T1, 2, and 3. So it's, it's surprising that um, we had so many node negative with even T3 disease. There was only one death in this group. And I've tried to track all these patients and there's only one or two that I haven't been able to find. At the time of, that I wrote this up, the median survival was 1600 days with a range of 106 to 2437. So I don't, I don't know if there's meaning in this, whether it means that there's a better, a better prognosis for patients who start with an IPMN derived tumor or not, but I'm kind of surprised at the N0 and all the way up to stage three in you know, two and three and with 11 patients, I'm really surprised at the median survival. I think this bears rechecking to make sure our, our stats are right. Next slide, please. And this is maybe the most important slide of all. So we had, for established cancers, we had these 18 patients, we already gave you the stage. For the surveillance patients that went to operation, high-grade dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, microinvasive cancer, one T1 that may be our only, our only fallout, and then one that was a second operation following a failure of a first. So if we take these 20 patients, I excluded this patient here, these 20, 13, 4, 7, 8, 9, 20, and put that over the total number of patients, then 0.85% of the surveillance population had cancer or high-risk histology. That's over a, a for all practical purposes, a 10 year period. So less than 1% were called out as having uh, high risk histology slash cancer histology, but very, very early at a curable stage. So 18 clinical cancers, seven early IPMNs from pre-op, so 25 cancers from IPMN. So let me just explain that. So we had 18 patients who were not in surveillance that had IPMNs, we had seven more that were in surveillance that had IPMN cancers. 
I did not include the high grade dysplasia here. That gave us 25 total cancers that came from IPMN. Our total operative experience over this time for adenocarcinoma pancreas was 224 patients. As I divided this out, it came out to more than 10% of the our adenocarcinomas were derived from IPMN. Next slide. Next. So fluid C, so I wanted to look a little bit at the, at the meaning of the variables that we're picking. So fluid CEA, the, the whole idea is it's a tumor marker. That's the worst thing they could call it. We found that 71% 71, uh, 71 of the patients had tumor markers over 1,000 and had less than or equal to moderate or low-grade dysplasia. And only 29% had greater than or equal to high-grade dysplasia. So this, we've, I think Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Cork would likely highly agree that these have become variables that may reflect mucin production, but they're not really they're not really valuable when it comes to assessing malignant progression. Next slide. Then the cyst size. There's 43 patients that we were that were valuable. The median cyst size was almost three in these in this group, and so we we did our cutoff as less than three centimeters and greater than three centimeters. And so to what degree did less than three reflect moderate grade uh, display, less than or equal to moderate grade, grade dysplasia? 63% of patients with cysts less than three centimeters had low risk and 50% of patients greater than three centimeters had high risk. So these are, these are I'm sorry, I had moderate dysplasia. So these were false positives. Um, on the other hand, less than three centimeters, was that a, good predictor for low risk histology. So you can see that these 37%, so this is a false negative patients had greater than or equal to high grade histology. When the cyst size was over three centimeters, it was 53% had high risk histology. So maybe that's the wrong cutoff. Maybe it should be three and a half or four. I don't know exactly The you know, the balance is hard to strike and it may be seen better in the context of other variables. Next. So the duct location, um, if it was a main duct or a branch duct IPMN, we, we all are, are um, you know, fond of saying that patients who have main duct IPMN are likely to have high risk histology. In this series, we had 18 with main duct IPMN, 39% of them had low risk histology and 61% had high risk histology. Next. Pancreatic duct size, zero to five, five to 10, and greater than 10. Here at the top of the numbers, we have high grade, high grade uh, dysplasia or above in 90% of the patients with greater than 10 millimeter duct size. And you can see this scales down as, as you drop down in size. Next. And the last one is the commercial risk stratification. Now these, this doesn't pertain to the patients in the surveillance cohort. This just pertains to the patients in those who went to operation. And I have to say, I, it, it's confusing to me because their assignment of low and high risk based on their composite metric doesn't predict as well as I would have liked. Uh, when they say that it's a high risk histology in eight patients, they were only right 12% of the time. When they said it was low risk histology, they were wrong 37% of the time. So I, I, I think that we may need to parse this out into individual um, molecular and genetic metrics. And I think that, that there may be other variables that might want to be thrown in to modify this. Next. So these, these are my conclusions. It is a population health issue. It's, it's difficult to implement a project. It's easy to frame it, but it is quite difficult to implement it. We, we do see a risk gradient existing that with expanding cyst and duct size and main duct IPMN. That the composite metric, that's the, that's the molecular and diagnostic risk profile score was only maybe wrong in one patient out of 2353. So it was very specific, but not as sensitive as we would have liked for the survey, the patients who went to operation. 1.9% were operated on of the whole surveillance cohort, less than 1% had greater than or equal to high grade dysplasia. However, those who were operated on had curative disease, and all of those patients were, uh, were considered cures. 
And then in our series, IPMN derived pancreatic cancer was 11%. Next slide. And this is the last, last slide. And so I just wanted to show you is just some stoichiometry about if, if the IPMN prevalence is 1% and it's somewhere between 0.5 and 2%, and you multiply that times 200,000 adults, that's 2 million people that would have IPMN. If you multiply that times 0.85% that we saw in our group who had high risk histology, that's 20,000 IPMN derived cancers over a 10 year period, that'd be 2000 a year. The incidence of pancreatic cancer is about 60,000 patients a, a year. So by the, by the calculations from the published literature, it would say that roughly 3% of pancreatic cancers per year might be found from IPMN. We found it was 11, you know, 11% in our series. Smaller sample size, only 224 patients. It might still have meaning. I think that number, this number may go up, this number may go down. But the point is, is that that it's a high risk, it's a high risk um, population. There's no question. Defining the right metrics to measure their risk progression is a most important feature of all. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Selby, for presenting the whole experience, and it was a very interesting talk. Next, we will uh, switch from pancreas to liver. We have Dr. Stafford. She'll be talking about. Uh, surgical management of benign liver tumors. As we all know, Dr. S uh, Stafford is Assistant Professor of Surgery at USC. She has been practicing liver and pancreatic surgery for nearly 15 years and has outstanding tra track record. And she's particularly interested in uh, duodenal cancer, neuroendocrine tumors, and cholangic carcinoma. And I present to you, Dr. Stafford. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheikh, for allowing me to present. Um, I'm gonna talk about benign uh, hepatic tumors or benign liver tumors. I'm going to focus primarily I'm going to focus primarily on hemangioma, focal nodular hyperplasia and hepatic adenomas. Uh, we'll start off with liver hemangioma. It's the most common benign tumor that you will see in adults. About 5% have hemangiomas. The incidence can range anywhere from 2 to 20%. These are clusters of blood-filled cavities lined by endothelial cells, and they're fed by the hepatic artery. The cause is unknown. There's a female um, preponderance, five to one, and most are asymptomatic or incidentally discovered. Spontaneous rupture is extremely rare. I have never seen it, and about 40% will grow over time. There's two types of hemangiomas. Capillary hemangiomas are up to 10 centimeters and are usually insignificant and do not cause symptoms. Giant cavernous hemangiomas are greater than 10 centimeters. They are likely to cause symptoms and will likely require some sort of intervention uh, such as resection and uh, could potentially cause something called high output cardiac failure. Now the blood flow inside a hemangioma is not normal. On the left, you'll see the straight artery. Uh, that's a straight tube as opposed to hemangiomas that have these tortuous cavernous um, blood vessels, and that's why the histology looks the way it is on the right. Um, this is a close-up um, of the histopathology. This is benign connective tissue with endothelial, endothelial cell proliferation. These are not encapsulated. Importantly, these are infiltrative but not invasive, and that comes into importance when you talk about treatment for these uh, hemangiomas when they become symptomatic. Um, imaging, uh, the best test is an MRI with gadolinium. Importantly, gadolinium is the better agent, not uh, EOVEST. Um, you can see here that there is contrast uh, along the periphery of this hemangioma, and they fill centrally towards the center in a centripetal fashion. This is a typical CT scan with the uh, contrast enhancement on the edges of a giant cavernous hemangioma. Now these are supplied by the hepatic artery um, and that's important um, simply because uh, when you're operating on them, they are very vascular uh, out in the periphery. On angiogram, you can actually diagnose uh, these hemangiomas with these C-shaped configurations uh, with those yellow arrows on the left there. And those correspond to the uh, vascular spaces from the pathology uh, where the blood is pooling. Um, 
there's different uh, sensitivities with uh, different imaging modalities, but suffice it to say that MRI with gadolinium is the best test. And if you uh, include MRI and CT scan together, you have virtually 100% sensitivity to make the diagnosis. Uh, this is uh, what typical hemangiomas look like. They're a little bit different. They can be kind of nodular, they can be kind of smooth, um, but they are relatively characteristic. Um, Kasselbach Merritt syndrome, just one slide about this. This is very rare. It's a consumptive coagulopathy leading to thrombocytopenia. Um, it can be potentially life threatening. You will see it in up to a quarter of hemangiomas that are giant, 15 centimeters or greater. And this condition reverses when you remove the hemangioma. Now, um, the best treatment for hemangioma is a nucleation. Um, you can see the middle hepatic vein there, that white structure on the right. These tumors, although they can partially encase major structures, uh, if you can get into the right plane, as demonstrated by this picture, they can come off very nicely with almost no liver parenchyma removal. And so when they are symptomatic, um, as long as uh, you work in the direction of finding the right plane, uh, the patients will do extremely well and should have very low uh, complications. Moving on to focal nodular hyperplasia, this is a classic look. Um, these tend to be subcapsular with a central scar. This is the second most common benign tumor predominantly in uh, women, third to fifth decade, about 80% are women. This is not a true neoplasm and it's felt to likely represent a hyperplastic response to an increased blood flow leading uh, to hypertrophy uh, in a prior arteriovenous malformation. These are polyclonal as opposed to monoclonal as they have Cooper cells in addition to endothelial cells and the like. Um, they tend to be solitary. They're usually less than five centimeters. They're often located in the subcapsular area. They can be pedunculated and they always have a central scar which is the strongly vascularized area, and they also are fed by the hepatic artery. They're sometimes referred to as a focal area of cirrhosis within a normal liver. The cause, again, is related to congenital abnormalities in the liver blood vessels, um, leading to increased blood flow and then growth of the lesion. Focal nodular hyperplasia is more common in patients with vascular disorders, such as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, and 20% of patients with focal nodular hyperplasia also have hemangiomas. You can see the blood vessel there in the central scar. And um, th this is an abnormal area leading to scar tissue and um, the central scar. Um, about 23% of patients that have a focal nodular hyperplasia will have a hemangioma. This is just one study looking at um, Two different groups of patients and the adenoma patients had no hemangiomas while six of 26 uh, patients with focal nodular hyperplasia had hemangiomas. Um, this is a typical angiogram appearance of a focal nodular hyperplasia with the central supply from the hepatic artery leading to that scar. And these also are amenable to enucleation. You can see in the picture on the left, the important structures are the, the, those are the whitest structures that, that can kind of peel off from these things. And so um, these uh, can often be nucleated, um, although often uh, we just resect uh, in a standard fashion. Um, just one case, I currently am following this lady. She is 32 years old with two months progressively worsening right upper quadrant pain. She had uh, difficulty sleeping due to the pain and some mild swelling in the lower extremities. Her BMI was on the high side, 36.5, and you can see the large lesion there measuring 11 by eight centimeters. It's in kind of a tough location and would require quite a large resection of trisegmentectomy versus potential enucleation. Um, this is an angiogram. Uh, that was done uh, because I was interested in um, trying embolization to shrink this tumor. You can see it's fed by the artery. Then you, uh, moving on, this is post embolization. You can see the artery just sort of ends uh, nowhere. And then this is the CT scan. You can see that the embolization leads to almost 100% necrosis. 
This is one week post embolization and it remains to be seen whether or not I will even need to resect this at all. I did biopsy this lesion to prove it was a focal nodule or hyperplasia before uh, embolizing it. So we'll see what happens over time, but this is um, an added uh, uh, approach to dealing with these patients. She, she was a large lady with a narrow costal vertebral angle and would have been quite a difficult resection. Okay, hepatocellular adenoma, I'll focus mostly here. Um, this is a uh, benign liver tumor derived from proliferating hepatocytes. It's monoclonal. Incidence is three per 100,000. Female to male ratio is four to one, although this may be changing over time, as you'll see coming up. Risk factors, of course, oral contraceptive use, anabolic steroids, glycogen storage uh, disease type one and type three, FAP and Fanconi's anemia. The risks are bleeding and malignant transformation. Now, with regard to bleeding, this is actually the most common risk factor with hepatocellular adenomas. The risk of bleeding is 64% versus malignant transformation of about 4%. Now, um, the bleeding risk, or actually in this study, there were 45 patients involving 195 lesions, and they classified the bleeding into three groups. Intratumoral was 69%. Intrahepatic was 21% and extrahepatic or intraperitoneal was 10%. So you can see that the bleeding risk is actually quite high and per adenoma, it was 21.5%. The mean size was 6.2 centimeters. They also noted that there was a significant increase in the risk of bleeding once the adenoma reached 3.5 centimeters and the p-value is very significant there. Other risk factors uh, that were associated with bleeding are lesions located in segment two or three, the left lateral segment, uh, the relationship to the capsule, in other words, subcapsular or exophytic, and visible vascularization on um, imaging studies. Uh, the old management of hepatocellular adenoma, if they're less than five centimeters and asymptomatic, we would observe them. If they're greater than five centimeters of symptomatic, we would offer surgery. That is now changing um, to some degree. Um, in 2006, Paulette Bialock Sage's group uh, were able to actually uh, subtype or subclassify these lesions into the hepatocyte nuclear factor one alpha mutated. These are the steatotic form of the hepatocellular adenomas, and they have a very classic uh, imaging uh, characteristic on MRI. The beta catenine activated adenomas, these are the ones that have the risk factor for malignancy. They're pseudoglanular, they're characterized by pseudoglanular formation and hyperchromatic nuclei. Then there's the inflammatory infiltrate uh, types with hyperchromatic nuclei and focal inflammatory infiltrates. You can see those white arrows there on the upper right picture. Uh, and then the unclassified that have no distinguishing features. Now this is uh, inflammatory uh, adenomas. They're the most common type, 40 to 50%. They tend to occur in older patients with metabolic syndrome. They're not often seen in young people with oral contraceptive use or not seen in them. Um, they occur most commonly in women. Hemorrhage can occur in up to 30%. They are associated with inflammatory syndromes. You may see associated fever, elevated Y count, elevated liver function test. The atoll sign, uh, you can see uh, with those orange arrows pointing to the inflammatory rim, that's present in 43%, and that helps the radiologist distinguish this particular subtype. 10% of these inflammatory uh, hepatocellular adenomas are beta catenin positive and therefore have some risk for malignancy. This is a typical picture of um, an inflammatory hepatocellular carcinoma. In the upper left, uh, you see the, the gross specimen A there. If you look in the center there, you'll see that there's some reddish areas. Those are areas of intratumoral hemorrhage. And um, in, in B, actually C and D, you'll see that uh, the C, image C is C-reactive protein positive uh, with the brown staining, and D is uh, serum amyloid A um, staining positive. And this is significant because this has uh, later been shown to be associated with risk for uh, bleeding and rupture. 
Um, the second most common subtype is hepatocyte nuclear factor one alpha inactivated. 35 to 40% of individuals have this. These occur most commonly in females with the history of oral contraceptive use. It's also associated in patients that have maturity onset diabetes of the young type three. These um, also are, can lead to intertumoral hemorrhage and pain. They tend to be multiple in about 50% of the cases, but they have a low risk for malignant transformation. This is what a typical um, subtype uh, hepatocyte nuclear factor one alpha looks like. You can see in, in figure A and B, um, the yellowish area in A is, corresponds to the higher fat infiltration and you can see the white um, circles, that's all fat droplets. Very characteristic of this subtype with a low malignant risk. Beta catenin is the least common subtype, about 10 to 15%. These tend to occur in men, which is uh, something new. They're associated with the use of anabolic steroids, glycogen storage disease, and FAP. They are also uh, at risk for rupture, but they have no distinctive radiologic features. And then the unclassified type has no known uh, molecular alter alterations. There's no specific histologic or protein expression uh, differences. Um, this newer subgroup came out of this unclassified hepatocellular group with the activation of this sonic hedgehog pathway. This is associated with obesity and bleeding. And um, if you look in the picture on the right lower A, you, again, you can see the gross specimen and those dark uh, red or purple areas are areas of intratumoral hemorrhage. Skip that slide. Um, so uh, there was a study uh, looking at the surgical uh, removal of hepatic adenomas uh, by Oliver Fargus and his group. Um, there were 218 patients in the study, 184 females, 34 men. They performed complete resection of the adenomas that were three centimeters or greater. 23 out of the 218 had malignant transformation. That was 10.6%. In the study, seven patients uh, had malignancy and male patients had, uh, where there were 16 had malignancy. So a predominance of male patients. Beta catenine staining was about 64% of these patients with malignant transformation showed beta catenine staining positivity. Interestingly, males had a much higher incidence of association between beta catenine staining and malignant transformation than females did at 25 they also looked at uh, the incidence over time, and what they found is that um, the incidence in men, uh, well, we'll start with females, the incidence of malignant transformation in females is shown by that red line there across, and what you can see is that that's kind of relatively straight and steady. So the incidence of malignant transformation in females has not increased over time. The total incidence of adenomas, benign adenomas has increased over time, but not increased in malignancy. Now for men, there's a rapid, relatively rapid increase in the incidence of hepatocellular adenomas over time. And the risk of malignancy is definitely on a higher, steeper trend. So um, what they found is that men outnumber women with regard to malignant transformation. The risk of malignant transportation is 10 times that of women. It's unlikely to be due to selection bias because both, it was both gender and time specific. And most, the most likely explanation for the malignant transformation is that this, uh, these adenomas are associated with metabolic syndrome. When they looked at the risk factors in the women, all had oral contraceptive exposure, but with the men, one had androgen treatment following a bone marrow transplant. One patient had Fanconi's anemia with hemochromatosis. Two patients used recreational steroids. Six patients met the metabolic syndrome who definition, and one patient had a BMI of 29 with hypertension and healed uh, hepatitis B virus. So what their recommendations were, any patient uh, that is male that has a pedestalar adenoma needs resection. Women of childbearing age uh, using oral contraceptives, the risk of malignancy is very low, especially if the lesion is less than five centimeters. 
However, women over the age of 50 or those whose hepatocellular adenomas occur in the absence of oral contraceptive use may require more aggressive management and or follow-up. If conservative management approaches chosen, biopsy of the hepatocellular adenoma may be useful to stratify the risk into steatotic, beta-catenin, inflammatory, et cetera. Um, they are also using MRI to help clear, characterize these subtypes. They are using MRI with EOVIST in particular. Uh, this can determine the subtype in up to 80% of patients, and it really only works for both inflammatory and hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha or the steatotic variety. beta catenin and Selnic hedgehog and unclassified types have no specific imaging characteristics um, to help us identify them. You can kind of see here the molecular classification, hepatocyte nuclear factor 1A, inflammatory, the inflammatory plus the 10% beta catenine, et cetera. And you can kind of see how these are connected with the radiologic imaging, the histo histochemical markers, and the, the pathologic diseases that they're associated with. So uh, basically, as far as the management goes, suspicion, if you're male, you go to surgery. If you're female, you look at the imaging characteristics first. If you're hepatocyte nuclear factor 1A, you may be able to just go on to observation, especially if you're less than five centimeters. In the other types, uh, stopping oral contraceptives and weight loss um, may be beneficial. And then um, based on the response to stopping the oral contraceptives and weight loss, uh, if the lesion remains greater than or equal to five centimeters, surgery is recommended. If you move on to biopsy, then beta-catenin um, positivity uh, is recommended to undergo surgery while the unclassified inflammatory and hepatocyte nuclear factor one subtypes can be observed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stafford, for presenting an excellent presentation about uh, benign tumors of liver. And uh, I think uh, most of the questions have been answered, but we have one question right now in the queue, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, can you comment on the recommendation of stopping OCPs in FNH and hemangiomas? So, um, you know, that's a little bit of a controversial subject. Uh, there are some reports in the literature where there may be some associated growth in hemangiomas or focal nodular hyperplasia with oral contraceptives, but there's no conclusive information that says that they should be stopped. So currently, only with hepatocellular adenomas, uh, the oral contraceptives need to be stopped. Uh, Dr. Selby, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, do you consider age as an indication for uh, surgery in pancreatic cyst? Do you have a cutoff at patients with early age with some risk factors should have surgery because it's going to be otherwise lifelong surveillance for them for the pancreatic cysts? So do you consider age in your decision making for these patients? Well, I think, uh, you know, there's two operations that are vastly different. Um, on the pancreas, one is a distal pancreatectomy, which is probably best done robotically. And the other is a Whipple, which is, is traumatic in its own right. Um, age is a consideration, I think, because the older, older patients, if they're not their chronology, but their performance status uh, is poor as reflected in an older age, but also in the variables that you pick to judge them by. But it's, I think that a Whipple is a, is a very debilitating operation. It means a fairly long uh, recovery period. And for those patients who are down and on their back or sitting in, on, in the couch all, on the couch all the time, they're not likely to recover the musculoskeletal uh, functionality that they may have had before. And so I think that has to be built into a discussion with the patient. So we, we kind of balance a, a difficult ledger when it comes to deciding who should get operated and who shouldn't if they're older age. And that's, you know, that's, we sort of guesstimate what the risk of progression would be and then plug that into whatever age they have and their likelihood of survival in five or 10 years. And we present that data to them. And most of, most of the patients appreciate a frank discussion about it. I think the older you get, the more willing you are to say, okay, well, two years is all I'm going to make it. So maybe I don't really want a Whipple. 
you know, I, I couldn't say exactly what the natural history slash behavior is for these because we haven't really got a very good handle on that. We've seen a lot of patients that, that stay stuck at one risk classification for a long time without progression. And as long as they're in tighter surveillance, then, then um, you know, we may still be able to capture the curable stage. And even if they do progress, some of them might just rather have some radiation or low dose gentle chemotherapy, even if they have a small lesion. So the short answer is yes, it does make a difference. Proximal versus distal resections. And, uh, you know, the, the discussion with the patients about the consequences mainly of, of physical functionality is a really important one. Uh, Dr. Siri, we had a question for you. I, I know you typed the answer, but uh, can you explain, are, there, are these all trials available at Hogue? Yeah, the, so, yeah, all of these are at Hogue. Um, the NK cells pretty much are only available at Hogue, which is great. And so, as I said, that's for newly diagnosed or second line or third line. Uh, the nutrition study, a lot of the patient's family like it because they supply the meals, so there's no cooking involved. Um, and then we'll have a WINT signal one uh, in the near future. So a lot more trials to come soon. I thank all of you guys for excellent presentations and all the participants. I don't think we have any more questions and we're able to actually pass the time by five minutes. Thank you everyone for your uh, excellent presentation and participation in this symposium. I know, I know the topics were very broad, but we just wanted to show what uh, things are available at Hogue and what do we have to offer. Thank you everyone for participation.